I'm looking forward to having a blast on a getaway with my friends, all thanks to your credit card. Suddenly, James called me. Lately, he's been returning home late, sneaking conversations on the phone with Sandra, and acting nervous around our place. It made me wonder if he had been planning something secretive all this time. I had my suspicions that James and Sandra were up to something together. Fortunately, I was ready for whatever they had planned. Maybe I should act shocked about it. What do you mean by yours? I asked, needing an explanation. I was already aware that James had plans to leave for a trip today. To be honest, I find it astonishing. If he thinks he can deceive me, I wish he had thought his plan through more carefully. I've been patient with everything up until now. However, today, I can't help but feel the need to seek revenge. I've always had a plan for revenge up my sleeve. It's high time we stand up to James and his sister after all the patience we've shown. I believe that by the end of today, things will start to make sense. I hope they enjoy their trip, not knowing that I have someone on the inside working with me. My name is Kelly Brook, and I'm 36 years old, living in a house with my husband James. I jumped straight into work right after finishing high school. Thanks to some experience and a recommendation from my boss, I've earned several certifications. In my company, these certifications and a solid track record mean a lot. At about 23, I was promoted to a lid position, which was quite an achievement as I was the youngest to ever do so in my company. Even though it's just a leadership role, it's a big deal to me. I always had this quiet goal of climbing up the corporate ladder, aiming to become at least a department head someday. As time went by, the company welcomed some fresh faces, including James. Even though I'm younger than him, I held a higher position at work. My job was to train James along with three other newcomers, making it three trainees in total. Hey Kelly, we're about the same age, aren't we? And you're already a supervisor? That's amazing, James remarked, showing his surprise. Yeah, I might be a year or so younger. I've been working here since I decided to leave high school early. It's given me a lot of experience, I explained. James seemed impressed by my early career focus. He would often praise me during those days. Eventually, James began to show interest in me, and although I was hesitant at first, I found myself falling for him over time. Our relationship followed a familiar path going out for meals, taking drives together, and eventually, we decided to move in together. Living with James, I started noticing his less meticulous habits. I thought it might be his way of showing trust, being his authentic self with me, so I tried not to let it bother me too much. After some time, James proposed and I accepted. We then sat down to talk about our future together. I'd love for you to be a stay-at-home wife, James suggested. I'll work and make money, and you can look after the house. It's the ideal setup. I also want us to start a family soon, buy our own home, and plan our wedding. I'm thinking wedding first, then buying a home, followed by kids. What's your take, Kelly? James, your plan sounds lovely, I responded. The sequence doesn't really matter to me, but we do need to think about our financial situation, especially with our savings and I'm not planning to quit my job, even if we have kids. We could arrange our work schedules to be more flexible. I'm just worried about how we'll manage financially if we decide to buy a house. Yeah, I understand that, James admitted, but it bothers me that you earn more than me. Still, I dream about us having our own place. I was hoping we could buy a house right after we get married. That might be difficult, I pointed out, hinting at the challenges ahead. Since I already make more money than you, James, let's focus on managing our wedding and getting a house for now. We can think about having kids later and figure out what to do regarding my job at that point. All right, let's go with that plan, James agreed. Deep down, I really didn't want to leave my job, but I proposed this idea to keep things balanced. Otherwise, I fear James might keep pushing his expectations on me indefinitely. During our engagement, we threw a party that both our families attended. James's sister, Sandra, was away traveling, 
so our wedding was the first time I met her. She barged into the bride and groom's prep room without knocking, sized me up with a smirk, and remarked, So this is James's choice? A bit on the simple side compared to his exes, huh? Oh, I'm Sandra, your new sister-in-law. Just so you know, I'm pretty straightforward with family. Um, I'm Kelly, nice to meet you, I replied, somewhat taken aback by her bold demeanor. Sandra waved dismissively and left the room, leaving me a bit shocked by her blunt introduction. Yes, this new sister-in-law of mine was certainly a character. Later on, I met Sandra's husband, who seemed like a reasonable person, in contrast. Our wedding ceremony was beautiful and went smoothly. James and I eventually purchased the house we both loved, and life seemed to be moving at a busy pace, prompting me to invest even more energy into my work. One day, when I was busy, the doorbell rang. I asked James to answer it. He returned, all smiles and laughter, with Sandra, who had decided to drop by unexpectedly. Kelly, hey, look at James, owning such a big house. That's pretty good for him, right? After all, he's my little brother, Sandra commented, making herself comfortable. I've been working hard. Feel free to make yourself at home. Kelly, do we have any snacks or something? My sister's here, so let's be quick. I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off with James's behavior. He seemed to puff himself up in his sister's presence, acting as if he was the sole owner of our house. It was clear he probably led her to believe he bought the house on his own. I played a significant role in making the down payment and continue to contribute to the mortgage payments for our house. Despite this, James was adamant about having the title in his name alone, and eventually, I agreed to it. Living together made me think it wouldn't really matter whose name was on the deed. However, the way James bragged about it to his sister rubbed me the wrong way. Still, I chose to keep quiet and not cause a fuss. Here are some snacks. James does put in a lot of effort, you know, I mentioned casually, trying to smooth over the atmosphere. Why does Kelly sound so in charge? She's not the boss or anything, Sandra remarked, a hint of annoyance in her voice. Well, actually, I am James's supervisor at work, I clarified, a bit surprised. Oh, is that so? Did James not tell you? When I joined the company, Kelly was already a manager. Since she started working right after leaving high school, it just happened that way. If it were up to me, I'd have surpassed her quickly, Sandra mused. Wait, you left high school early? You seem so responsible, yet you're less accomplished than me. Sandra asked, a bit mockingly. Is there an issue just because I didn't finish high school? I responded, trying to keep the peace. No. Not really. But Kelly, since you're not a high school graduate and I'm your sister-in-law, I can ask you for anything, right? That's the rule, Sandra joked, though her tone suggested she wasn't entirely kidding. Kelly, whatever my sister wants, she gets. If you refuse, I'll have to ask you to leave the house, James added, seemingly backing up his sister's outrageous claim. I was baffled by their conversation. Why would not having a high school diploma and her being my sister-in-law mean she could demand anything from me? And the threat of being kicked out of my own home for not complying? Was this some sort of bizarre joke? I managed a polite smile and quickly retreated to the kitchen, needing a moment to collect my thoughts. From there, I could still hear James and his sister talking, and it sounded like they were serious about what they had said. A little while later, Sandra followed me into the kitchen. Hey, Kelly, I actually need to ask you for a favor. What is it? I asked, already dreading the request. I need to borrow some money, like $5,000, please, she said, as if it were a small favor. How is that a small amount? That's quite a lot. What do you even need it for? I questioned, trying to grasp the situation. Come on, it's just $5,000. You're a supervisor, right? You must have a good salary, Sandra pressed, assuming my financial situation would easily cover her request. The entire conversation felt surreal, leaving me to wonder how we'd gotten to this point. 
Sandra needed the money to cover the costs of renovations. When I reminded her about boasting of her new condo recently, she brushed it off, huh, did I? Well, just give me the money. James said he'd lend it to me and told me to ask you. What? Why would he make such a decision without consulting me first? I was taken aback by James' assumption. Listen, Kelly, you either give me the money, or I'll call your boss right now and tell them you're resigning. Which will it be? Sandra put me in a tight spot. All right, Sandra, I'll lend you the money, but there's a condition, I asserted. We need to draft a promissory note. What? Even though we're family? Sandra seemed surprised. Yes, I want it in writing. So when you come to collect the money, bring a valid ID with a photo, okay? Ew, such a hassle. But fine, if you're giving me the money, I'll come over tomorrow night. Sandra reluctantly agreed. Despite the inconvenience, I knew it was crucial to get Sandra's agreement in writing. True to her word, albeit grumbling, she brought everything required the next day. Through this ordeal, I realized just how much James was under his sister's influence. It was frankly absurd. No matter what I said, it wouldn't have made any difference, it seemed. Later, I discovered Sandra spent the money on designer items, and after the initial loan, she started asking for more money without any shame. I insisted on a promissory note each time, and within a month, she had borrowed around $12,000 from me. Just when the situation seemed unbearable, I received an unexpected call from my boss. They wanted to promote me from a supervisor to a department manager. I was ecstatic. This was a step closer to my dream of becoming the head manager. Eager to share the great news, I rushed home to James, who had taken the day off. I'm home. James, guess what? I announced my arrival. Welcome back, Kelly. You seem thrilled. What's up? James greeted me. Today, my boss called me in, and guess what? He offered me the position of department manager. I've always aimed to be the head manager, so I'm incredibly excited to be moving closer to my goal. Ho, oh, wait, what? Kelly, you're getting promoted. James's reaction mixed surprise, with perhaps a hint of disbelief, underlining a day full of revelations and reaffirming my commitment to my career goals amidst the family drama. I don't understand. Did you actually say yes to the promotion? James asked, clearly puzzled. Yes, I accepted it. I've mentioned my career goals to you before, haven't I? I responded, surprised by his reaction. Wait a minute. You should have asked for my permission before making such a decision. What were you thinking? Plus, I've always said I wanted you to be a stay-at-home wife. How is it that you're moving up while I'm stuck in the same spot? Doesn't that strike you as odd? James questioned, frustration evident in his tone. That's not my responsibility. I've made it clear I don't want to quit working. Why you haven't been promoted is something I can't answer, I replied, standing my ground. Soon after our exchange, James made a call, presumably to his sister, because she showed up a few minutes later. Hey, I've heard you snatch the promotion that should have been James's. What gives? She accused me right away. I didn't snatch anything. In our company, promotions are awarded based on one's performance, I explained calmly. So, what you're suggesting James isn't good at his job? How could you look down on your own husband? Sandra snapped back, twisting my words. This is absurd. I muttered under my breath as they decided to celebrate at my expense, grabbing my bank card right from my purse. Despite my attempts to resist, they overpowered me, leaving the house with laughter as their parting shot. Tears filled my eyes as I realized the magnitude of my mistake in marrying James. Regrets flooded in, but it was clear what I needed to do next, find a reputable divorce lawyer. James didn't return home that night. The following day at work, he approached me with a smug expression, yesterday was so fun. Nothing beats a feast paid for by someone else. Thanks for covering it. He handed me the receipt from a high-end barbecue place showing a charge of $1,500, along with receipts from luxury bars amounting to a staggering $9,000.
I was fuming inside but bit my tongue as more colleagues arrived. On my way home, I checked my bank account and was horrified to discover a total of $9,000 had been withdrawn. I confronted James as soon as I saw him. James, what on earth were you thinking, spending $9,000? On fancy meals and bars, no less. That money was mine, saved from before we were together, I exclaimed, barely containing my anger over his reckless spending and disregard for our financial well-being. As soon as I walked through the door, James started complaining about me nagging him. When I brought up the issue of the money he had spent, money I had saved before we got married, he dismissively said, I don't know and I don't care, it's already spent anyway, and locked himself in the bathroom. That was the last straw for me. I decided then and there that I was going to divorce him. Over the weekend, I visited a lawyer, and in the weeks following, the preparations for our divorce moved along smoothly. James's behavior hadn't improved. He continued to come home late and rushed out early on his days off. Just when I was considering hiring a detective to see what he was up to, I received a call from Ryan, my brother-in-law. Hello, is this Kelly? Ryan's voice came through the phone. Yes, Ryan. It's unusual to hear from you. What's up? I replied, surprised by his call. Well, it's been a while. I'm actually calling to ask if Sandra is with you, he said. No, Sandra isn't here. Why do you ask? I was curious. She's been coming home late and disappearing on weekends without telling me where she's going. She mentioned she was at James's place when I asked her yesterday, Ryan explained. That's interesting. James has been acting similarly. They might be going somewhere together, but frankly, it's no longer my concern, I shared, distancing myself from the situation. Oh, and Ryan, there's something I need to tell you too. I continued, sensing an opportunity to share my experiences. Ryan was taken aback by my indifference, but urged me to continue. I told him everything, about the money Sandra had borrowed from me, James's extravagant spending, and my decision to divorce James. Hearing all this, Ryan sighed deeply. Is that so? I'm sorry about my wife. I've been at my wit's end, thinking about divorce but haven't been able to take that step, he confessed. Ryan, why don't you use the evidence I've gathered? It sounds like we're both dealing with similar issues. Maybe it's time to teach these reckless siblings a lesson they won't forget, I suggested, feeling a bond of mutual understanding forming between us. Yeah, let's work on this together, Ryan agreed, a note of determination in his voice. Then he mentioned something intriguing Sandra had been pushing him to take a long vacation, and he had noticed travel brochures on their vanity. Curious, I decided to investigate a shelf in our house that James always kept off-limits. To my astonishment, I found travel brochures and club cards hidden there. It all made sense now, they were planning a trip without us knowing. Ryan, I think they're definitely planning a trip. I just found evidence of it, I informed him, both of us realizing the depth of our partner's deceit. This newfound information solidified our resolve to proceed with our plans for divorce and hold them accountable for their actions. I stumbled upon some travel brochures hidden away, sparking an idea. As I shared my plan with Ryan over the phone, he couldn't help but laugh and agreed to play along. We concluded our call with a promise to coordinate our actions through text messages. I also forwarded him some evidence that might be useful for his own divorce proceedings while we meticulously strategized our next moves. Three weeks later, just as the sun was rising, James left our house a plan I was privy to thanks to a heads-up from Ryan the previous day. A few hours into his adventure, James called me, boasting about how he was going to enjoy a trip using my credit card with Sandra and their friends. His late nights and secretive phone calls had already aroused my suspicion that they were plotting something. Fortunately, I was ready for their games. Fading surprise, I asked him to clarify. With a smirk in his voice, James revealed that they had been planning this trip for a long time and viewed Ryan as a safety net in case their plan fell through. 
They thought I was becoming too confident and decided it was time to teach me a lesson, as he put it. James's words were meant to belittle me, suggesting I couldn't stand up to their manipulations. But I was beyond feeling hurt or angry, I felt nothing at all. I questioned James about his earlier comment regarding my debit card, playing along with his illusion of victory. Confused, James insisted he had taken my card, but I calmly informed him that my card was still with me in my wallet. There was a moment of silence before he stuttered, questioning what card he had bragged about using. I revealed, much to his shock, that he had mistakenly taken an old gym membership card of mine, it matched my debit card in color and size. Realization dawned on James as he confirmed it did say fitness club on the card, and he began to question his mistake, wondering if he had mixed up the cards. Amidst this confusion, Ryan, who had been listening in on speakerphone, couldn't contain his amusement. James's grand plan to splurge on my dime had crumbled over a simple mix-up with a gym card. This blender not only foiled their extravagant scheme, but also marked the beginning of their comeuppance, with Ryan and I ready to move forward with our plans, strengthened by the absurdity of their mistake. James was adamant he had seen his debit card, but his plan had fallen apart. Ah, so this was Sandra and your scheme. He lamented, realizing he had been outsmarted. I'm so disappointed. Actually, last night, I swapped your debit card with the gym membership card. It seems you didn't bother to check this morning and just took off with it, I revealed, enjoying the turn of events. What? What are you playing at? James was clearly frustrated. No, I should be asking you that. Tough break, huh? Don't get too full of yourself just because you're my stepbrother. Got it? I countered, not letting him intimidate me. James tried to brush it off, you'll see. We have gifts for you both when we return. You think you can bribe us? I won't accept anything but cash, he bluffed. We'll see about that. Look forward to it, I dismissed his comment, focusing on the situation at hand. What are you going to do now? Oh, Kelly, can you send us some money? James finally asked, his tone changing. I ended the call there, his message following the call, trying to threaten me with involving Ryan, only received a nonchalant is that so from me before I went back to sleep. When I woke up in the afternoon, my phone was flooded with missed calls and messages. I first called Ryan, then decided to pick up James's call. Hey, finally, send the money, please. It's so cold. I think we're going to freeze, James pleaded. The reason for their discomfort was clear, they were in Alaska. In February, the cold there is biting, and if James and his group were complaining, it meant my plan had worked perfectly. Really? You mentioned Ryan would help, right? Or is he not there? I played along. What? Do you know something? James's confusion was evident. Should I fill you in? Since you and Sandra decided to team up, Ryan and I did the same. It's quite simple. I explained, enjoying the irony of the situation. Now, do you understand why I kept you on the phone for so long during that first call? It was to buy time, and Ryan, he's on his way back here on another plane. The revelation seemed to hit James hard. Our coordinated response to their scheme had left them stranded and cold, far from the luxurious getaway they had anticipated. My satisfaction came not just from thwarting their plan but also from the solidarity Ryan and I showed in facing their deceit. As soon as I received confirmation that Ryan had boarded his flight back, I ended the call with a clear message to James. We've joined forces to teach you a lesson. Now, find your way back on your own. See you. And with that, I hung up, eager for Ryan's return. I took this time to call my lawyer setting up what would be our final meeting about the divorce before James and his companions could make their way back. I anticipated a confrontation upon their return and wanted to be fully prepared. Just a few hours later, as predicted, James and his entourage arrived, bursting with indignation. Kelly, what the hell? You better be ready to move out. Ryan sided with you, hasn't he? Why do you return before us? This is unbelievable. You think I'm okay with this? 
Apologize now. Shut it and sit down. Ryan intervened, his usually calm voice now booming, commanding James and his friend to sit immediately. They complied, shocked into silence by Ryan's authority. Our lawyer wasted no time, distributing his business cards to James and his friend, who looked utterly confused as they accepted them. Without further ado, Ryan and I presented them with a stack of papers. Their confusion turned to shock as they skimmed the documents, their complexions draining of color. Wait, this talks about dividing property. You're not suggesting a divorce, are you? James stammered, disbelief coloring his tone. It's on mine, too. A divorce? What did I even do? This has to be a joke, right? James's friend echoed his disbelief, looking from one to the other for confirmation. Yeah, right, Ryan responded, his tone final. I'm heading home. I've had enough. I've been recording your daily tantrums for a while now, including that call you made during your so-called vacation, James. You really don't see the problem with your behavior, do you? I can't keep living like this. Wait, are you serious? James's voice was tinged with a sudden realization of the gravity of the situation, as the reality of impending divorces began to sink in. The tables had turned entirely, with Ryan and I standing united, ready to move forward from the chaos they had created. I mentioned it before, didn't I? I want half of the down payment we made on the house, plus the remainder of the mortgage, and I want back the savings you used from when I was single. I firmly stated my demands to James. Turning to Sandra, I continued, and you, Sandra, you're going to repay me for the money you borrowed and the additional amounts you withdrew from my savings along with James, right? Sandra tried to deflect. Wait, James was the one who bought the house, and I never borrowed or spent any of that money. You're making false accusations. Sandra, please review the documents. There's a promissory note outlining exactly how much you owe, I pointed out, undeterred. No way. I don't know anything about this. Without proof, I'll just dismiss this as useless, she retorted, attempting to downplay the seriousness of the evidence. Both James and Sandra acted rashly in response. James crushed the recorder under his foot, and Sandra ripped the paper to shreds, both wearing smug looks of defiance. Look here, James, destroying that recorder changes nothing. The data's still saved on my computer, and Sandra... That document you destroyed wasn't the original. You've accomplished nothing, I calmly explained, revealing their efforts to be futile. What the hell are you three even trying to do? James's frustration was evident. Oops, was my simple reply, highlighting their lack of foresight. To Sandra, I also have a claim against you for all the savings you squandered, not to mention the cozy time you spent with that guy at the bar, I added, revealing more of their misdeeds. Faced with the reality of their actions and the legal repercussions, both James and Sandra started to break down, tears streaming down their faces. The financial reckoning was harsh but fair. For James, the total came to $135,000, $8,000 for emotional damages, $100,000 for the house's down payment, and $15,000 for miscellaneous expenses. Additionally, there was an upcoming loan repayment of $4,000. Sandra's bill amounted to $35,000, which included $11,000 for miscellaneous expenses and $31,000 for the loan she had acknowledged with the promissory note. As for Ryan's claims against Sandra, given her intentional distress and frivolous spending, the total was $135,000. $55,000 for emotional damages and $80,000 for miscellaneous expenses, all calculated without dividing any assets like condos. This stark financial and emotional toll underscored the consequences of their actions, serving as a potent reminder of accountability and the importance of integrity in relationships. After the fallout, I half expected James and Sandra to attempt suing us, given their track record. However, our sharp attorney had already anticipated such moves, including a clause in the settlement paperwork essentially saying, 
If you try to sue, you'll surely lose. No one will represent you, and it'll only cost you more. Focus on your repayments instead. With that, we managed to avoid court altogether. I collected my things and left our shared home behind. Word of the whole ordeal somehow reached my workplace, leading to James being transferred to another branch, which helped put some necessary distance between us. Not long after, James reached out with a message that took me by surprise. Kelly, I miss you. Life's empty without you. Can we try again? You can focus on your career all you want. But I knew better than to fall back into that cycle. It's not going to happen. Goodbye, was my firm reply. Then came Sandra, trying to play the family card. Kelly, think it over about my brother. What if we all live together again? Maybe we just misunderstood each other. I think things could be better. My response to her was just as resolute. Sandra, it's not going to happen. I'm sorry, goodbye. Both of them pleaded, but I stood my ground, cutting off all contact. Ryan, it turned out, received similar pleas, but also chose to ignore them. One day, passing my old house in a taxi, I noticed a for sale sign out front. With the settlement paid in full and all communications cut, I had no clue how James and Sandra were faring, nor did I want to know. As for me, I've moved on and up literally. I bought a condo and settled into my new life. Work has been fantastic and I was recently promoted to regional director, a role I've long aspired to. Ryan and I have also grown closer, finding comfort and compatibility in each other's company. We've gone out a few times, discovering a surprising ease in our interactions. Life has vastly improved post-divorce, confirming my decision was the right one. As for what's developed between Ryan and me, well, that's a tale for another day.